I'm going to give a quick presentation about this paper called Roving Oddball Paradigm Elicits Sensory Gating, Frequency Sensitivity, and Long Latency Response in Common Marmosets. This was published in the Open Access Journal, Ibro Neuroscience Reports in 2021. Uh, this paper reports a reanalysis of data from Komatsu et al.'s study published in 2015. Komatsu et al. made data from one of their monkeys available via the website neurotyco.org. In their study, they presented roving oddball stimulation to the common marmoset, and the roving oddball paradigm consists of different length tone trains, so repeated tones of the same frequency um, that were um, presented consecutively. So we have a, a change in uh, tone train frequency, right? Either ascending frequency change or descending frequency change. And um, from this sequence, the standards are considered to be the ones at the end of a tone train, right? The final repetition of a, a particular frequency tone whereas the deviants are considered to be the first presentation of that frequency uh, tone. Uh, so you can see here, the standards are labeled in yellow and the deviants are labeled in light blue. And uh, after running this experiment, you can extract the waveforms evoked by these stimuli to produce the eventilated potential and analyze mismatch negativity. Uh, the authors had recorded uh, ECOG or electrocorticography uh, signals um, across one half of the cortex, and they identified one good auditory cortex channel that showed very clean or relatively clean auditory responses. In this study, I wanted to address the question of whether the ascending frequency or descending frequency transitions were the same. Right, depending on the frequency pre preference of the cortex uh, closest to the electrode, uh, these are not necessarily equal. Right, if tone frequency sensitivity plays a part in the responses that are being measured. So here's a, a snippet from the figure one of the paper. At the top, we see a, a representation of the roving oddball paradigm uh, sequence. The different colors here, colored markers, represent different tone frequencies. And um, the, the number of repetitions in each uh, tone train <clears throat> were either 3, 5, or 11. So you can see some um, markers appear to uh, make a longer uh, sequence here. And to analyze this data, the last stimulus in a tone train was considered the standard, and uh, the one preceding that might be denoted standard minus one, just to show that it preceded the standard. Whereas the first tone in each uh, tone train was considered the deviant, or we might also label it S1 because it's the first uh, stimulus presentation of that frequency, and then the subsequent stimuli S2 and S3. At the bottom left here, panel B shows the uh, different frequency tones that were used in this experiment. So there were 20 different frequencies ranging from uh, very low, almost zero hertz, but definitely not zero, maybe like 500 or 300 hertz up to almost seven kilohertz. Um, so these were the stimulus frequencies used in the tone trains. And uh, it's important to have balanced frequency transitions here in such an experiment. Um, if there was an imbalance of frequency transitions, like if we had just high frequency transitions um, going towards one side or the other, that might be expected to affect the results. And the, these, uh, the bottom right panel D shows the electrode locations, right? These, these were positioned on a grid across one hemisphere of the cortex. And uh, the auditory cortex was located around this region. And uh, channel 25 was identified as uh, showing particularly robust uh, auditory responses. Okay, here's the first analysis of the data. So 
the uh, the top row here shows the ERP from this monkey, and uh, it's a very long four stimulus ERP <laughs> showing the evoked response from the standard, the deviant, and then the uh, second repetition of the deviant and the third repetition. So we can see based on this that the deviant does produce an enlarged response here. Right, you can quite see this is, is much uh, higher, right? This is more negative, uh, bearing in mind that this is an inverted uh, y-axis. So this is a higher negative peak. And um, there is also this subsequent portion of the response, right? Which is more subtle, but it is apparent here that there's a dip. And these, uh, this is shown using a, a yellow arrow here at the bottom. So I, I measured the magnitudes of the auditory responses using a triphasic response measurement or TR, which is annotated here using white circles and lines, right? So this was measured from uh, every trial from this monkey. And these measurements are shown in panel B. Um, it's quite difficult to see among all the data points, but the deviant response uh, on average was higher but the other three were very similar, right? There, was, there, there wasn't any pronounced difference between the, the subsequent repetitions of the stimulus. <clears throat> um, to analyze this uh, long latency response, I used a double epoch subtraction. And uh, that involved averaging standard and preceding standard waveforms and the deviant and second repetition uh, responses and then subtracting them. So the intention here is that uh, we get the effect of the deviant minus the, the standard preceding the standard or the, the stimulus preceding the standard. Uh, whereas the stim second response, this one and the standard approximately cancel each other out. Right, we can see here that there is a difference, right? Presumably this is caused by uh, this part of the S2 response being slightly larger than the standard response, right? This small jump here, uh, but that's, that's very small in comparison with the difference between the deviant and the stimulus preceding the standard. Uh, but we can see here that based on statistical analysis, there were significant differences across this early time window, and then also uh, substantially across the long latency window, right? So this previously was not identified from this data set. A factor that we need to consider here is the influence of the number of repetitions on both the standard response and the deviant response. Uh, the top left here, panel A, shows the auditory response to stimuli in different uh, positions of the tone train from S1 or deviant up to S11, uh, bearing in mind that the maximum length of a tone train was 11. And we can see here that the deviant response or the first presentation of that frequency is obviously enlarged, right? But here we could say that not qualitatively that different, right? It looks like just an enlarged feature of this waveform. Um, obviously, it's very difficult to interpret or nigh impossible to interpret the sources that, that uh, give rise to this difference. But we can see here that at least they, they peak at a similar latency. And we can see that the, 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 the higher the number of repetitions, that that tends to decrease, right? And this is fitted, or this, the triphasic response magnitudes are fitted with an exponential decay function. So you can see this on panel B. So there's obviously a, a large effect of stimulus repetition on the standard response or just on the auditory response in general. Um, in contrast, the deviant RP ERPs we're not substantially affected by the number of preceding standards. So here D4 represents a, a stimulus change or a deviant stimulus happening after tone trains of length three. And 
D6 represents the deviant presented after tone trains of length five, and uh, D12 uh, is the deviant that was presented after 11 repetitions of uh, an identical stimulus. And based on the triphasic response magnitude, there's not a substantial difference between these three uh, evoked responses, right? They're very similar, slight difference here, but in general, that doesn't affect the, the overall shape of the response. Okay, another factor that, that I considered was the effect of frequency sensitivity. So we know that the auditory cortex has a tonotopic organization with many uh, subfields that have tonotopic organizations as, within them, uh, which means that different parts of the auditory cortex are sensitive to different tone frequencies. Uh, when using an oddball sequence with different frequencies, uh, this is obviously an issue that needs to be uh, looked at, especially with um, intracranial electrodes positioned on the cortex, right? Like getting the ECOG recordings. So we've got channels 24, 25, 26, 29, and 30. And uh, we can measure the auditory evoked responses from these channels and then characterize the best frequency as the one which produced the largest amplitude auditory response, uh, again, based on the triphasic response magnitude. Now, of course, there are, there are other ways to, uh, to um, quantify the auditory response, but in this study, um, the triphasic response magnitude was used. Uh, so we can see here that channels 30, 26, and 25 had much larger amplitude responses, particularly to at the 500 hertz frequency, right? All three were most sensitive to 500 hertz frequencies. And that includes channel 25, which was the best channel um, recognized by Komatsu et al. in their study and also analyzed here. And the other two channels, 29 and 24, produced smaller amplitude responses. Um, and these were also more sensitive to the higher frequencies uh, tones, higher, higher frequency tones. Uh, and so we can't really, we cannot do a proper tonotopic mapping here because we don't have the uh, spatial resolution required uh, uh, to do that. But um, we can put this down to, perhaps these regions of cortex, auditory cortex, being more sensitive to the higher frequencies. Okay, so coming to the final figure of the paper here, um, I analyzed the difference waveforms uh, from different conditions, right? So the, the first condition here, uh, panel A, the ERPs from the standard and the deviant based on our conventional um, mismatch response calculation uh, are shown in the top left, whereas the top right shows the difference waveform uh, calculated conventionally by standard minus deviant. And you can see this does, does produce a, a statistically significant difference across this time window um, based on this enlarged response. Now the panel B shows a similar analysis, but this time the the tones were the same. So we've got the deviant tone here in yellow, and then the second repetition of the deviant in uh, kind of light gray here, uh, and then the, the, the third repetition of the deviant in red. And the difference waveforms were calculated based on subtracting the, the repetition from the first stimulus, and you can see that produces a very similar mismatch response to the standard minus the deviant. In contrast, when we try to compare the difference between the third repetition and the second repetition, there's almost no difference and no statistically significant difference between these two, S2 and S3. So this um, calls into question the importance of having a standard that's been repeated many times, because if only the second repetition of, of the stimulus evokes a response which is very comparable to the standard and also produces a mismatch response almost identical to the standard, then it doesn't necessarily agree with this idea that the standard 
needs to be uh, presented many times to, to, to have formed a representation in the cortex. Okay, the final analysis here compares the effects of ascending and descending frequency transitions. So we can see the, the responses to ascending frequency and descending frequency transitions. The descending frequency deviant transition produce a, produces the largest response. And this is also evident in the mismatch response calculated by subtracting the descending frequency standard from the descending frequency deviant. Um, in contrast, the ascending frequency deviant produced far less difference compared with the ascending frequency deviant. So this shows that this um, mismatch response is asymmetric based on the um, frequency transitions, ascending versus uh, descending uh, tone transition. So the highlights of this paper were that there was an enlarged response to deviant stimuli that uh, decayed exponentially with stimulus repetition, uh, characteristic of sensory gating. There was also a long latency response viewed over 300 to 800 milliseconds after the deviant was played. And it was found that the mismatch response uh, was asymmetrically sensitive to frequency transitions. Uh, in this case, more sensitive to the lower frequencies and de descending frequency transitions. If you're keen to learn more, you're very welcome to read the paper here. Thank you.